word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Good morning. Good morning. Normally I like to begin with a, a psalm or something uplifting, but I just had so many scriptures that I needed to fit in this morning that I thought I would uh, just go ahead and toss that one in early. It is so good to see everybody there. As some of you may have already noticed, I lost my glasses. And so there may be more of you out there than I realize. There may be less, I'm not sure, but however many there are, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming.
Um, the, 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 the change my heart, oh God, the, the song, change my heart, oh God, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, Moses writes, Berashit bara Elohim. In the beginning created God, right? And the words are different because we speak a crazy language. Most of the languages in the world have that word order, right? In the beginning created God, the heavens, and in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, right? That's what it says, that's what it means. But the word, the Hebrew word there, bara, Betresh um, Aleph Bara means to uh, create out of nothing. It is never used of anybody except God. Right? When when a person creates a thing, when when a man makes a building or or someone makes a sculpture, we don't create it. We take existing matter and rearrange it. Right? You can, you can sit down if you like. Uh, <laughs> um, but God doesn't create that way. God creates bara, ex nihilo, as the Latin, out of nothing. So in David's prayer, in David's psalm, uh, created me a clean heart. He says to the Lord, uh, he uses the word bara, create, make out of nothing. He's saying, he's saying, don't take the heart that I have and, and wipe it clean, because you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't wipe it clean. You have to replace it. Again, God goes to Ezekiel and he says, I will remove from you your heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh, one that I can touch and one that I can move. God uses this same example, the same idea of not cleaning a heart, but replacing it. So when we come to the New Testament, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and Jesus is working with a 2,000-year-old idiom. He can't say, um, create a clean heart in me. He can't say, remove my heart, because Nicodemus has read that. He's read that over and over and over again, and he still didn't understand it. So what does Jesus say? Jesus says, you have to be born again. You have to be created fresh. And how do you become born again? How do you become created fresh? You have as much to do with your new birth as you did with your old one. That is, nothing at all. God is the one who creates. God is the one who restores. God is the one who creates and adds a new heart, makes new people out of each of us. Uh, now we come to, I believe, our guest, our Apostles' Creed. Uh, please uh, recite with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified died and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God and Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Those words aren't scripture, but they're all based very solidly in scripture. I've, I've found at different dark times in my life, um, when I couldn't, when I couldn't articulate what I wanted to say, when I, when I couldn't, when, when the words didn't come to me about how I wanted to express my my faith, my understanding, my, my worldview, the, the underpinning that makes everything else in my life stand upright, that I could recite this creed. Um, that it was, uh, I, I won't say it, it's better than reciting scripture, although it is certainly better than reciting a single verse. It gives a, a better 
overview and a better understanding, a better foundation for who we are as Christians and what we believe. Uh, now we come to our prayer and share time. If anyone has any prayer requests or praise reports, let us make them known. Yes? Yeah, I ran into a police officer in Columbus uh, last week, and uh, he seemed to be afraid of, of me. Um, I hadn't said anything to him, but, but he, he, he was, you know, I, they're receiving so much hatred, I guess, that it, it would be easy for, for people to, uh, um, anyway, so I, I, I thanked him for his, his, you know, I told him I was glad he was there, thank him for what he was doing. He seemed very relieved. Um, they're, they're, um, they're doing a very difficult and very thankless job right now. We need to remember our law enforcement. Thank you. Any other prayer requests or praise reports? I have one more. Yes. Um, Karen is here today. A praise report on our legacy time donations are still coming in. I meant to see Heather last night, but I, I have a twofold thing here. Um, I had a wedding last night with Vera Welker, the pastor at the Clarksburg Church, and choir members. We are going to think of something. They need us, and we need them this Christmas. The whole church, we're going to try to think of something we can do as a group, like we've done the last two years, maybe so more social distant uh, and better, but we're going to get together here soon. So keep thinking of that and get ideas in your head, okay? Um, I'm going to see Marilyn tomorrow, so we'll see what we can get going. And on the bells, the donations keep coming in. I didn't get with Heather last night, but I do have more checks and everything right here. So last week we were nearing $9,000. So 
I wouldn't be surprised if we haven't met the 10,000 at this point. So, what a tribute <laughs> and to our church and our people. So. Amen. What a wonderful blessing. Thank you. Um, praise report. Probably should have gone under announcements, but I think this is pretty worthy of, uh, of being thankful for. Next week uh, will be the first Sunday of October, and we are going to return to having communion. We're going to be doing socially distanced communion, um, which means that each group, like you're, you're sitting in, in clusters there with your family members or your spouse or your, your kids, each group is going to get a, uh, a, loaf of, a small loaf of bread or a small piece of bread in a bag, um, and then there'll be some, some juice. And I'm not sure how we're gonna do the ju juice yet, but we'll figure that out too. Um, but I think that we need to return to um, as much normalcy as we can as soon as possible. Uh, I think we've, we've done a great job so far of, um, of, of, of socially distancing and wearing our masks and, and being as safe as we can. Um, but uh, the, the sooner we can get closer to normal, the, the better off we'll be. So, are there any other prayer requests or praise reports before we... Yes, sorry. Uh, please, uh, let's keep remembering the schools and the teachers and, and uh, kids and all their activities. Let's uh, keep them in our, in our minds and our prayers so that uh, they can enjoy the school time to the best they can be in their praise. Uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, the, the prayer night or the, the uh, Bible study we had Wednesday night and we had a great turnout. And uh, let's keep building on that because that was awesome. And thank you for leaving. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a great time. It was a good turnout. Uh, we had people in the Bible study who don't go to this church. And I think that's pretty awesome. So let's, uh, let's keep that up. You can invite your friends, um, and, and we'll see what happens. All right. If there aren't any other prayer requests or praise reports, let's go before the throne. Blessed and Holy Father, we come before you as you bid us. Father, there are no accidents in your kingdom. You are in absolute control, and you have called us to this moment. Father, each and every one of us is here right now in this church, or listening to this, this service, by your divine appointment. Father, it, it, it sounds us to, to realize, to understand, to think about how much you are involved in our lives. It's you, Father, who causes the rain to fall and the sun to rise. And we know how these things happen, Father. But that doesn't, doesn't remove the need for a cause. But Father, we also understand that that you are present in our daily lives, in the little tiny things that we do each day. Father, we stand amazed that you, the creator of the universe, the God of everything, the Lord of all that is or was or ever would be, would take interest in us. The more so than that, Father, that you would love us so much. You sent your one and only Son to die on a cross that we might have life with you. Father, these things are too wonderful for us. These things are too amazing for us to understand, to comprehend. And so, Father, we respond in the only way we possibly can. We worship you. We bow humbly in your holy presence. We lift our hands in praise and our voices in songs and our hearts in abject worship of you who are and who is and who was and who will be. Father God, you are holy. You are good. You are just. You are true. You are righteous and powerful and wealthy and mighty. You alone are God. And we worship you. Father God, we have sinned against heaven 
and against our fellow men. We've done those things we should not have done, and we have left undone those things we should have accomplished. And there is within us no peace. But Lord, you tell us in your holy scriptures that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just, that you will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Father, in these next few moments, in the silence of our own hearts, we make our private confession before you. shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Anointed One, we are forgiven. It is truly marvelous in our sight. Now, Father, as a righteous and redeemed people, we stand before you. We lift before you, Father, those requests we have spoken this morning. We lift also before you, Father, those we have kept hidden in our hearts. Lord, we ask that you would be with Rick, with Bob, with Philip, with the Kane family, with our law enforcement in these difficult and tumultuous times, Father, with our schools, our teachers, our students, our faculty, our administrators, our staff. Father, our nation is Father, our nation is having a very difficult time. But Lord, you are the solution. With your peace, your love, your justice, your forgiveness, Father. We ask that you would rain down these things on our nation like drops of baptismal water. Father, we ask your blessing on our nation and its leaders, especially going into this election cycle. Father, we ask that you would be present in what is going on, that your will would be done, that your chosen leaders would be installed, that our nation might once again be a shining city set upon a hill, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dark and hurting world. Father, we ask also your blessing on this church and its congregation. Lord, we ask that you would use Frankfurt United Methodist Church as a light in a dark place, as salt in a flavorless world. Lord, that you would use us to reach out, to spread the gospel for the saving of souls of Jesus Christ, that the word of the Lord might truly go forth from Frankfurt United Methodist Church. And that your name would be glorified above all, through all, and in all. 
Now, Father, as we go into the remainder of our service, we ask that you would be with us. Lord, we ask that you would open our ears and loose our tongues and soften our hearts that we might know and speak and hear the wonderful, holy truths of your scripture. These things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Anointed One, who himself has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not on temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Rich Mullins said, There are things you can learn in your prayers that you can't sing in your songs. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, um, to Galatians chapter 4, beginning at verse 21. The text will be on the screen as well. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present-day Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. This is the proper uh, text for the memory verse, by the way. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Would you bow your hearts with me, please, for just a moment? Father God, in these next few moments, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, my rock, my redeemer. Amen. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Does anybody know what the oldest book in the Bible is? Show of hands, anybody? Rabbinic tradition suggests that the writer of the book of Job may have preceded Moses. Some scholars believe that Moses may even have had a copy of Job with him during the Exodus event, before he began writing the Torah. Now, there are, of course, scholars who disagree on this, but aren't there always? And Job, as a text, struggles with this concept of righteousness before God. In Job, chapter 8, and verse 20, we read the following. Behold, God will not reject a blameless man. 
nor take the hand of evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouting. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame. The tent of the wicked will be no more. Then Job answered and said, Truly, I know that it is so. But how can a man be in the right before God? Surely, Job says, God does not punish the righteous ones. So how is it possible that any of us should be righteous before God? Who among us is righteous? Who among us is deserving of a pain-free life? Who among us is upright before God? Job, or possibly the author of the story, because Job may not be history, it may be a wonderfully written parable is dealing with the absolute holiness of God looking at his own sinfulness and just simply being honest about the situation how can a man be righteous before God now this is a continuous theme throughout the book and perhaps you know the story Job who is described as blameless and upright before God was a wealthy man then God points Job out to Satan when Satan comes before him. Now, there's, there's some deeper theology here uh, that may be the, the, so the Hebrew in Job, it says the Satan. And Satan being a Hebrew word, being accuser or adversary. So, where in Job we read Satan, we should actually read the accuser. It's not a, uh, it's not a proper name just yet. Um, and that's the rabbit hole that we will not go down this morning. But uh, God points Job out to Satan when Satan comes before him, and Satan accuses God of playing favorites. So Satan is given permission to strike Job, and in two separate attacks, he takes away everything that Job has. He takes away his wealth, his home, and his children. As Satan leaves Job's wife, but since she suggests that Job quote, curse God and die, um, it's somewhat less than helpful. So Job sits down in the ashes of what he had to mourn, and his three friends come and mourn with him, and for the first seven days, they all sit in silence, mourning with him. This is the best thing they do throughout the entire book. Then, at the beginning of chapter 3, Job begins to lament, and the conversation begins, and for the most part, Job's friends take the same approach. God does not punish righteous men. So you must not be righteous, they tell him. Confess your sins and repent. Job, however, insists that he has not sinned. And so they discuss the matter for 34 chapters. And along the way, they ask the question, which is central to our discussion here, how can a man be righteous? before God. Job chapter 25, verse 1, Then Bildad the Shuite answered and said, Dominion and fear are with God. He makes peace in his high heavens. Is there any number to his armies upon whom his light does not arise? How then can man be in the right before God? How can he who is born a woman be pure? Behold, even the moon is not bright, and the stars are not pure in his eyes. How much less man who is a maggot and the son of man who is a worm? You see, build that. The Shuite here answers Job in a terrible way. He says, you can't. It cannot be done. You cannot be righteous before God. And normally I would agree with build that. Now Paul would too. In Romans chapter 7 verse 14, we read the following. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate, that do I do. I'm, I'm reading one thing and quoting another, I'm sorry. Verse 16. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer... I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. 
For I have a desire to do what is right, not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Paul, the apostle, the one who spoke frequently to Jesus directly, sinned every day. He didn't want to. He despised the sin within himself, but he found that he could not avoid it. He tried. Now, have you ever tried to go a day without sinning? Just one day. I set myself a goal once. It was a, a beautiful summer day, and I said, I'm going to go from sundown on this day to sundown on that day. I'm going to follow the Jewish day. I'm going to go from sundown to sundown, and I'm not going to sin. I'm going to leave. I'm going to live one perfect day in my life. So I, <clears throat> I, I, I dedicated myself that day to prayer, fasting. I went to bed very early so that I didn't have as much time to sin that evening. I woke up and I read my Bible. I listened to some hymns. I, I got on YouTube and I, I found some of my favorite preachers and I listened to about 15 of their sermons. I worshipped God all day long. And as the sun was sinking low above the horizon, I was sitting on my front porch with my feet propped up on the railing and my Bible in my hand, thinking about what a wonderful job I had done. How proud I was that I hadn't sinned all day long, that I had done something that I didn't think was possible, and I kind of intellectually, mentally, emotionally hooked my thumbs under my suspenders and puffed out my chest, and then I realized that the entire day I had been wallowing in my own pride. It wasn't, it wasn't a sinless day. <laughs> it was a day of my own making, right? A day where I relied on myself to get me through. And it all came tumbling down like the house of cards that it was. Here's the worst part. The sins I commit each day they're the big ones. Every single day. I say this to my shame. It sounds like I'm bragging here. I'm not sure how it can sound like that, but but you know, I can the big sin. Yeah, no, wait. No, I just this is I say this to my shame. Murder, adultery, violence. I have committed all of these on a daily basis. Well, who have I killed? Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 18, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, not until, uh, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your right to succeed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never and to the kingdom of heaven. But then he goes on to describe what he means. He says, the law is valid. When the law says, don't murder, don't murder, right? But then in verse 21, he says, you have heard it said to those of old, thou shalt not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you this, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. As if that weren't enough. He says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Who can be righteous? Before God, if this is the standard, and it is, there's got to be some breathing room here somewhere that we can hide. So we turn back to Jesus in Matthew, and he, he says, You've heard it said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. 
pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. And just in case you weren't feeling miserable enough yet, he continues, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus starts off talking about obeying the law and ends the sermon by saying, you have to be perfect. And what does Moses say? Leviticus 19 in verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You must be perfect. You must be holy. Therefore, we agree with Bill that the Shuite. It cannot be done. I can't be perfect. It's like this, this story of the guy who uh, breaks into a house, right? And they eat. He wrecks the, wrecks the place and he steals the money out of the money box. And on his way out, there's a police officer standing there and they, they slap the cuffs on the guy and they throw him in the tank. And a week later, he, they, he's hauled in before the judge. And he goes to the judge and he says, yeah, I did it. I did it. I stole the money. I wrecked the house. But I promise you, from here forward, I will never again be involved in breaking and entering. And the judge says, well, I certainly hope not, but that's not why we're here. The judge says, I'm not here to prevent you from doing future crimes. I'm here to punish you for your past crimes. You see, the sin that we already have inherent in our being is always with us. We have all sinned, Paul says, and fallen short of the glory of God. So even if you could be perfect from this day forward, it wouldn't be enough. And yet we read in Genesis chapter 15, beginning in verse 5, and he brought him outside and said to him, Look toward the heaven, and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Verse 6, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Again, in Habakkuk 2 4, behold, his soul is, up, is puffed up. It is upright, it is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. And back in Galatians, we read, for freedom. Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You see, the good people at the church of Galatia had fallen into the same trap so many of us do. They wanted to work for their salvation. It's a precious and exceedingly valuable thing, and it's human nature to try to earn those wonderful gifts that we get. Our pride, our own sense of self-worth, our misguided piety tells us that we must earn what we receive. Just like Martin Luther in 1507, climbing the steps of St. John's Ladder, we try to do whatever we can to earn our salvation. It's human nature. It's so easy fall prey to some charismatic teacher who comes along and says, yes, but... And pretty soon we're back under a yoke of bondage, trying to earn our, or earn or merit our own salvation. What good is the law? The law shows us the right way to live. But when you look at the law through the filter of the Sermon on the Mount, as we did a few moments ago, you see that it is an utter impossibility. You can try, certainly, and you should, but the reality is that you will not succeed. The law shows us what sin is, and then shows us that we each are sinful. But Jesus Christ, our Lord, Fully God and fully man, pure, righteous, and holy comes to take upon himself our failures, our misery, our death, and to freely give to each of us his righteousness. Do you 
believe this. That's what matters. Do you believe? Your actions are important, yes, but do you believe? Do you believe God in the same way that Abraham did? Do you live by faith as God told him back Now, on a side note here before I conclude, I realize how very little bit of the Galatians text I dealt with. Some of you are still scratching your heads and wondering who Hagar is and what was so important about her son. This, however, is a testament to the depth of the scriptures. I've spent this whole time talking about a single sentence from the text, and I still feel I haven't done that one sentence just or justice. And worse yet, I'm repeating some of the points I made in the previous sermons about this topic. So why would I do this? Why would I spend this sermon going over such a tiny bit of text and repeating so many things from previous weeks? Because these are the things you must know. If you understand that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and not of works, not earned or deserved, then you have the gospel. How are we made righteous? How can a man be righteous before God? How is the law fulfilled? Believe. Have faith. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. He will make your path straight. Amen. Would you bow your heart to me, please? Father God, our magnificent shepherd, we are your sheep. We fully know, Father, that sheep are definitely not the brightest animals in the field. But Lord, we thank you that you have made the gospel simple. That you have given us this one thing to do, to simply believe. That if we believe, we are made righteous before you. Father, we believe. Help our unbelief. Those of us who struggle with doubt or worry or fear, Father, touch them. Touch us. Reveal yourself to us, Father, in some mighty way that we may never doubt again. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. For our closing hymn, let's turn to uh, 419. I am thine, O Lord. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Oh, uh -huh.
Unscripted. I just try to try to try to capture something of the message, and I guess it would be this: that we are not the children of the slave; we are the children of the promise. That Christ comes to free us, and that in our freedom we have liberty to behave as we as we want. Yet our hearts turn to God, and we behave towards Him as grateful children of a loving parent. So let's remember that we are the children of the promise. And that though we are not saved by our works, that we show gratitude through them. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give unto you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.
Have a great time. Nice job. Thank you, sir.